Silent, so I think I should seize it. <laughs> so, um, well, as the director of the Institute of Religion and Critical Inquiry at HCU, I'm joined with Professor Matt Crawford and his team in the Biblical and Early Christian Studies program, and all of you present in person and online, in welcoming Professor Christoph Marksch to Melbourne. You only arrived this morning, so. <laughs> I hope I will not sleep away during my lecture. <laughs> Otherwise, you can have a coffee. <laughs> <during my lecture. laughs> um, I also uh, wish to convey the apologies of the Vice Chancellor and President of ACU, Professor Smatthus Curtis who regrets that commitments in Sydney have prevented his coming to Melbourne for this lecture this evening. And he wants to convey that as personally. So I do that on his behalf, Christoph. Also the DVCRE of ACU, Professor James McParran, is also committed in Sydney and regrets that he's not able to be present. And before I formally introduce Professor Marchish, we begin by acknowledging the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, traditional custodians of the land on which we meet here in Melbourne and pay our respects to their elders past, present and emerging. Well, it is indeed a great honour to welcome Professor Markshish to IRCI. The planning that began in 2018 is only now coming to fruition <laughs> due to the obvious reason, the pandemic. In these three years though, um, there's been a succession of things happening Professor Mark Schiess has been successively Dean of the Faculty of Theology at Humboldt, Berlin, President of that same university, and is now President of the Berlin Brandenburg Academy. Professor Mark Schiess is considered one of the leading patristic scholars and church historians of our time. He studied evangelical theology, classical philology, and philosophy in Marburg, Jerusalem, Munich, and Tübingen. He has held chairs successively at the Friedrich Schiller University in Jena, Rubrik Karls University in Heidelberg and Humboldt University, the last being the chair once occupied by Adolf van Pranen. Professor Mark Sheesh contributes to the fields of Gnosis, early Latin Fathers, the Doctrine of the Trinity, ancient Christianity, as well as what he was evening, early church history in general. Many will know his many books, including his 2019 book, God's Body, Jewish, Christian and Pagan Images of God. This week with us in Melbourne, Professor Mark Shish is sharing with us the English version of the Ratzinger lecture series, which he originally gave for the Joseph Ratzinger Foundation at the University of Regensburg in 2017. The further lectures in the series will be given here in this room in Melbourne, um, 11 a.m. Melbourne time, Tuesday, Thursday, and Friday. This evening, we commence with the first lecture, the history of Christianity as a theological and or secular discipline. Professor Markish will speak for about 50 minutes. And while the other lectures will involve a question time, tonight's lecture will not. Those here in person can field any questions they have during the reception that starts at around 7 p.m. Those online can leave them on the Zoom chat. So please join me in welcoming Christoph for this assembly. Thank you for that kind and friendly introduction. It's a great pleasure after such a long time of planning to be physically here. 
I'm extremely happy, and it's a great pleasure to be invited. Um, but I'm especially grateful to be invited to present an experiment here, because these are not the Regensburg lectures of 217 translated, but it's a form especially developed for you. So an experiment. I um, decided not to publish the 2017 lectures, but a little bit to test versions of the lecture and to wait for comments. And so I'm extremely curious to hear your comments today during the reception and in the following days. Uh, that's one of my expectations uh, linked with my coming to Melbourne. Um, the topic of the lecture is far away from the subjects I'm normally dealing as a professional historian of ancient Christianity, history of Gnosticism, the history of um, Christian attitudes towards time, uh, one field um, which interests me at the moment. Um, I'm talking today about the fundamental question of whether, and if so, how history differs when told by historians or by theologians. That's the question. Is there any difference? And is, if there is any difference, where is the difference? That's mm. the question I'm asking. And whether the answer is no, there is no difference, and there should be no difference, or yes, there is a difference, answer will be given, finally answer uh, on Friday. <laughs> in, in the last lecture today, only the general, um, how to say, prospectus, the general horizon of the question. Wrong volumes? Any move? The slides? No. <laughs> yes. So um, that's um, the table of content of today's lecture. Uh, an introduction. We are in the midst of the introduction. Then a second paragraph. Uh, history of Christianity slash church history. I will discuss the difference between those two in the third um, uh, paragraph or chapter of this lecture. So history of Christianity, church history, a subject between departments, history of Christianity versus church history. And I suppose because for reasons of time, I will uh, dramatically shorten the force a universal history slash global history from a Christian perspective, but definitely I will end with concluding remarks. That's <laughs> quite clear. And um, there is a difference to a wonderful book um, which I would recommend to all of you, uh, Ron Williams, in 100 pages, uh, mastered uh, the uh, general question, why study the past, and mastered to tell the history of the Christian church from his specific perspective in the 203 um, lectures, um, Sarum lectures at Salisbury Cathedral. Um, I'm far longer, and I'm dealing with a far more basic question, uh, the basic question uh, whether the study of the past differs when done by theologians and done by historians. Um, and I'm to a certain extent simplifying the problem because there are historians in departments of theology, there are theologians in departments of history, uh, when talking about um, history done by theologians, then I'm implying with this uh, terminology, people especially doing history and being at the same time, not only people in an uh, institution of theologians or in a theological institution, but um, aware of their being um, theologians. 
So this was already the introduction and we move to the second paragraph, um, which is entitled History of Christianity slash Church History, a subject between the departments. Um, I now will explain how I describe more accurately the position of history of Christianity, church history. We will deal with these two terms, with a whole question of terminology as situated between historical graphical and theological requirements. And I do not regard this position of the subject as a dangerous situation as a challenge and a chance between two cases um, as a form of interdisciplinary, uh, uh, sorry, interdisciplinarity common in the sciences and becoming <clears throat> even more so, which is already incorporated in the subject definition. This interdisciplinary or interdepartmental position between uh, history as part of the, um, according to the German system, um, uh, faculty of or for philosophy and the faculty of theology between history and theology. This interdepartmental position is thus explained in the um, second paragraph, history of Christianity slash church history, a subject between departments. This is indeed done only in the form of a thesis and that I had to apologize in the beginning. Um, the whole presentation in these four lectures is more or less a thesis. We are looking to examples, examples from antiquity. We are looking to examples from the 19th and 20th century. We are neglecting medieval times and early modern times. Um, we are concentrating on German um, and Roman and Greek authors. So uh, it's a, a very limited diversity. It's a far too high number of old wise white men. I apologize. Um, but uh, I think um, starting at a certain point, my, my interest is not to, to give a complete overview. My interest is not to present to you in a nutshell a history of the history of Christianity, but studying a problem. And so these are examples, and you are invited to bring other examples. And from the not known to me Australian experience <clears throat> with, with a completely different um, <clears throat> history and contemporary situation with a completely different uh, diversity of the population and institutional history, you probably would add completely different examples. The interesting question is whether the framing and the general insights will change and that's perhaps something we can discuss uh, Tuesday Thursday and Friday. So um, church history, a subject between departments. Church history as a subject, just as the other subjects of a theology department are too in their own specific ways, a subject between departments. That's a characteristic of um, subjects in a theological <coughs> department, exegesis, um, systematic theology, uh, practical theology, religious education is located between practical theology, a discipline within a theology department, and educational science. And here in the building, as I saw, these departments are located. And it's an interesting question how interaction functions and how interaction shapes certain subjects and disciplines. Um, so uh, it is located between, regardless of the answer to the question of whether the relevant subject representative perceives this position as being such or not. And there are a lot of people not realizing this position, but this position exists. 
Church history was and is an example of a thesis that the essential aspects, um, so it's not a problem of history of Christianity or church history, it's a problem in the humanities uh, because history of Christianity, church history, is an example of a thesis that the essential aspects of organizing the discipline based on history, research subjects, methods, theories, research purposes are frequently not supplements to disciplinary definitions, but rather intervene in an interdisciplinary fashion. So, um, the, the message uh, of this beginning of the second paragraph is quite simple. The problem or the charm, the challenge of history of Christianity, church history between the departments and between the disciplines is a characteristic of a lot of uh, humanities um, disciplines and humanities subjects. And uh, this was a quotation of the German science philosopher Jürgen Mittelstrass. Uh, one could um, add a lot of English speaking philosophers of science to uh, which I avoided. You could this do uh, if you like, or we can discuss later. If we describe the position outlined above using the term intermediate, this initially means with respect to its Methodology canon, history of Christianity, church history is exclusively obligated to general history science. That's uh, something which I think is quite clear. The methodology, the methodology canon of history of Christianity, church history slash sciences <coughs> is exclusively obligated to general history science. It reconstructs the past based on certain generally introduced methods from materials that within the framework of heuristics were identified as sources. There are no sources uh, from the shelves shouting, hello, I'm a source. They have to be identified as sources. That's a hermeneutical process. Are we accepting this or that as a source for a certain question? Then categorized by source criticism as sources of a certain status, uh, valuable, contaminated, mutilated source, and so forth. Uh, as sources of a certain status and were ultimately used based on an interpretation of these precise sources for a representation of an analytical or narrative nature. These methods are described in the usual method, method of that's after a long journey, methodology <laughs> books. Uh, sorry, um, for the subject in these wonderful classroom books existing in all languages and actually also in the broad subject consensus in its various subcategorizations and characteristics. That would be a chance to add an excursus on social history, gender history, but th there is a broad consensus on the basics. Uh, regardless specific differentiations between historians in uh, different fields. If we compare the discussion of methods of general history science and history of Christianity slash church history, differences do indeed come to that. At the latest in the wake of the so-called linguistic term, considerations about language and the specific conditions of historical narration belong to the general historiographical method. This has um, led, for example, in England, but not only in England, to a broadening based on social history of a classic history of ideas and become a comprehensive intellectual history. There are a lot of other developments. This is, again, only one example. In the historiography of dogma and theology, 
And now I'm concentrating and arguing on Germany, but perhaps you could add your personal view on Australia, England, France, and um, other countries. So uh, in Germany, this had a few repercussions today, however. There is a certain lateness of history of Christianity um, and um, church history in Germany um, concerning the paradigm shifts and the turns in the general um, history discipline. Um, and uh, this is perhaps not only characteristic for the German situation, this form of lateness. Even if an over hasty reception of each new historiographical paradigm that is proclaimed as a rule by a few representatives, there is something of fashion in it. The new fashion is this or that, and one can follow fashion, that's nice, but one should be aware of that's fashion. And uh, so uh, lateness has certain positive aspects. It's a, a fashion critical attitude, um, but uh, one should aware that fashion critical approach shouldn't lead one to a, a, how to say, conservative blockade against new developments. And so the question is whether the lateness Story, uh, history of Christianity slash church history is uh, uh, such a positive um, hesitation or resistance to adopt every new fashion, this year red color, next year blue color, or it is a kind of blockade. Um, I, I remember a, a wonderful visit in the birthplace of Leopold Ranke, the famous German historian, and there was at the same time a meeting of the Society for Military History in Germany. And I had the impression this is a far away branch of uh, history, <laughs> and all the new historical methods weren't introduced in. So the question is, are history of Christianity, church history, uh, people a far away branch um, and the um, lack of certain developments in their monographs and articles uh, a sign of their far away or of a blockade for certain reasons or of a um, quite positive hesitation against every single fashion um, proclaimed every year for the uh, fashion exhibition somewhere or the fashion events. Admittedly, church history as practiced by uh, theologians, that, that means not by people in theological institutions, but by theologians who are interested to do history of Christianity slash church history as theologians, has another dimension. For the aforementioned methodological canon is indeed applied within the framework of the worldview of Christian faiths. That's my definition for history of Christianity slash church history practiced by theologians. These are people doing it in the framework of the worldview of the Christian faith. And um, this is said um, regarding the plurality of a worldview. There, there are different worldviews. There are worldviews of Christian faith in different parts of the earth in different genders, in different traditions, theological traditions. And the interesting question is a German liberal uh, and a German neo barchian theologian, is the difference larger between a theologian from Africa and from Scandinavia? So um, a worldview means different worldviews, and there are common um, strata and common insights in these different worldviews, but uh, there is a plurality of worldviews, and it's a quite broad definition. Uh, the um, history of Christianity slash church history I'm looking uh, for is one done by people framed by the uh, framework of the worldview. 
view of a world view of a Christian faith. Um, this worldview framework has been substantiated in the diverse Christian understandings of reality of the various subject representatives for many centuries now. For our considerations in this lecture series, um, it is initially less important whether an individual historian of Christianity church historian working in a theology department is aware of this uh, Christianity framework. Um, obviously, there, there are people fully aware of, people completely neglecting it, coined by, but completely neglecting it, and people interested to level it down. Not only rhetorically, but to level it down for certain methodological reasons. The question as to whether and how the worldview framework characterizes the specifics of day to day work at all is only of secondary interest because it's quite clear. For example, the question whether we should use in the reconstruction of papias a dative or a genitive is far away from this framework. So in a lot of all day questions, this framework is definitely not present. Um, but there are, we will study questions where the framework is present and where it is a question of transparency to address you. And it's a question of how to say a, a question of um, a scholarly uh, precision to reflect on it and not to neglect. Also, there are uh, two types of historians uh, in, in German, if I'm allowed to reduce complexity to a duality, uh, historians interested in such methodological questions and historians completely not interested in discussing such questions. And interestingly, those interested in methodology often are not interested in detailed historical analysis of certain times of the past and vice versa. And I try to act in these two fields, which is not quite easy. I'm asking the question now um, how we can describe this um, acting in a framework of a Christian worldview or of a Christian view to uh, uh, the world, um, how we can frame this and can describe how this is um, relevant for all day um, historical work. And I propose to ask the question of leading categories. Um, the question according to which leading categories our work is done. Category is not meant in the classical ontological sense of an era of being, but merely in terms of the logical higher level basal structure of historical analysis that it assumes method or method, methodical responsibility. Sorry, <laughs> that's after having slept two uh, evenings in a play. <laughs> so category describes the, the higher level basal structure of historical analysis. And I'm using now an example to uh, explain um, how this is, uh, how my idea is. Um, historical work can be imagined similar to the recently completed restructuring of Our Lady's Church in dress. Left Our Lady's Church after collapse in February 1945, um, and right Our Lady's Church today after rebuilding. Um, the worldview framework and the leading categories mentioned correspond to the building supervisor's knowledge of building statistics, the foundation, and the world. 
Also, unlike the Church of Our Lady in Dresden, historical reconstruction can, for reasons of time alone, only establish a drastically diminished and reduced model. So there were stones laying in a large mountain of stones. And um, for the reconstruction, there um, must be a set of um, general categories of how a world functions, how uh, a building should be built to survive the next winter storm. And uh, this is um, not present in the uh, all day question, stone A next to stone B or stone C next to stone D, but present in the general architecture of the collecting and rearranging the stones. That's my idea of these categories. Now I'm proposing a completely artificial arrangement of these categories, uh, completely artificial because it's quite clear we could, if we have four weeks or a whole term, completely change this table. Uh, the, the function of the table is not to present the complete framework or the complete structure, but to um, present um, main categories, categories helpful for identify the presence of framework in all day historical work. And uh, so I propose um, uh, these um, dualities of order chaos, individual society, actions suffering, and a certain uh, and uh, a fourth dual which is not in line with all the others, space and time. A short explanation of these. The Berlin historian Rudolf Herbst recently placed order and chaos in the center of his theory of history. This is according to Rudolf Herbst. I apologize, I've forgotten to bring in um, a picture of him, but uh, he's looking, uh, you can look into the internet. He's from the Humboldt University. And uh, Herbst pointed out that essential phenomena of more recent history, especially contemporary history, cannot be understood without taking chaos theory into account. Somebody who regards chaos as the primary state, primary state of the world in all society will reconstruct the past differently to somebody who only regards chaos as lower level decomposition product of the constantly prior order. It's clear if you have a worldview in which chaos is primary stages of the world, you will reconstruct the stones of Our Lady's Church differently from someone who is convinced order is primary. And the thesis is theology is <coughs> in which way ever not blind to this question. And I'm not arguing for um, theology in every case is for a Lutheran theology of the early 20th century is for order against case. There are definitely other theologies which place the, the arrangement of case in order. But my thesis is only every theological framework, every worldview of Christianity different from each other in regard of gender, continent, and all other things, has a clear cut position concerning the question how the relation between order and chaos is. And that, to a certain extent, um, is related to a history of Christianity. For example, beginnings of Christianity. While some will describe the rise of Christianity as ordering of a chaotic state, of, as ordering as a, of a chaotic Roman state and economical world, crisis of the third century, and of the dist 
perturbed psyche of imperial population, age of fear. You remember probably all these titles I have in mind at the moment. Others will point at the well ordered political, economic, and mental structures of the high empirical period and not look for prior chaos. Roman Church as ordering primary chaos. Roman Church as chaos destroying primary order. So the, the, the question of order chaos is related to a, a Christian worldview and all Christian worldviews have certain presuppositions concerning a um, order and chaos. The same applies for the second relationship, individual and society. After Max Weber, this was well addressed um, in all of the social historian works, um, and there are comparable in uh, the British, French, and um, I took here the most influential German uh, Deutsche Gesellschaftsgeschichte by uh, Hans Ulrich Weber uh, from Bielefeld. And, and uh, now I could explain um, the question whether individuals, man make history, the, the famous sentence of German history, or in country, society, groups, um, aggregations of people are the driving forces of history. That's a question where most historians consciously or unconsciously are bound to a certain position. And again, here, my thesis is, it's not um, a, 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 a completely um, a, a distinguished from the Christian worldview and theology, whether you are opting for the uh, primary value of individuality or for the primary value of society. A uh, German liberal theology um, from Schleiermacher on is uh, voting strongly for the individual. Others are criticizing. And so probably you can analyze lots of theological um, coinage of historians uh, of unconscious uh, coinage. For example, Velo, the social historian, uh, came from a very pietistic uh, region of Germany, so he is deeply interested in society. Not surprising that he wrote a history of German society. And actions and suffering, I'm only shortening the, the question uh, of free will. The, the question whether you are able to control your own actions or your own action is, is deeply related to a Christian worldview. If you are a strong Augustinian and convinced that people are not able to act free, but are by concupiscentia or a, a new neurological theory there is no difference. Uh, what is the, the explicit presentation? But uh, the, the question whether you are um, convinced that, that people are acting or more or less suffering, um, what is this, uh, decisions made by other people, by society or whatever, is deeply related to the Christian world or to certain Christian values. And regardless whether uh, the historian is conscious of this or not, I have to shorten um, the, the course, um, but, 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 I, but I, I would like to, to present also here um, uh, one example, individual and society history of reformation is Martin Luther as the individual and Calvin the driver? Or is it only how, how to say um, the, the wonderful idea that uh, he gated a fuse of a powder keg? Um, so the, the situation and the society is of interest. 
and uh, the, the question by action and suffering, that there is a wonderful thesis that we have to distinguish two parts in the thinking of Nicholas of Cusa, a southern uh, part of thinking, the Rome thinking, because there was a wonderful light uh, in the atmosphere, and so in the thinking of Nicholas of Cusa, and then the dark phase when he was in Germany in the dark <laughs> northern parts. And uh, one of the leading experts in the uh, uh, Cusano's research uh, called Flash distinguished that suffering, suffering of the dark, uh, wooden, <laughs> lightless uh, atmosphere of Germany <laughs> and producing philosophy in this way. And uh, called Flash uh, is uh, deeply coined by certain theological assumptions um, during his study time uh, of theology, uh, of Catholic theology and the lifelong discussion of the Augustinian dog view against free will. So um, one remark, um, it's not only that um, theologians uh, institutionally related to faculties of theology are coined by these um, Christian worldviews, but also historians. Ulrich Wehler um, grew up in a pietistic atmosphere in Germany called Flash Study Theology before converting away from theology and religion and moving to philosophy. Uh, so there are um, historical narratives produced by people far away from theology, but coined by certain forms of Christian worldviews or reactions against such Christian worldviews. I have to show you um, a, a little bit. My impression is that uh, one can describe, that's the, the end uh, of this paragraph, one can describe the relation between um, the um, historical methods and these um, cate um, categorizations coined by a Christian worldview um, with the Council of Chalcedon. It's uh, this uh, wonderful form of an uh, asynchitous henosis, an unmixed unity, or these wonderful adverbs you all note, unchangeable, unseparated. Um, so the, the Chalcedon idea that there are two distinguished, uh, how to say, two distinguished approaches, the historical method, the unchanged historical method, and those general principles, I labeled them categories, and those uh, two, like the two natures of Christ, are unseparated and undivided. That they are um, in certain historical narratives together, and that's um, regardless uh, this um, two natures union, these unmixed two natures union is realized by the historian or is unrealized. That's um, uh, uh, um, a little bit shortened um, what I have said. Uh, would like to say in my first paragraph, and now the second paragraph, the question, um, church history, history of Christianity. I skip Ernst Trosch, um, a short sentence to Ernst Trosch. Um, I have, I'm, I'm realizing too much material for the 50 minutes, but it uh, doesn't matter. We, we can discuss it. Uh, uh, tomorrow, Thursday, and Friday. Um, and it's better to have too much <laughs> than not enough. Um, Charles um, was originally the conclusion uh, of this paragraph because Charles said um, one should strictly divide between uh, dogmatic um, and historical method, and it's impossible to combine. That's the, the opposition against what I have said. But the interesting thing is, most people are reading only the first part of Trosh. Uh, in the second part of uh, his article, then uh, 
surprising pseudo theological um, idea of history is introduced and so one can analyze Trough's article as an example for my thesis also arguing against it. And uh, that perhaps we can discuss if you're interested in one of the following cases. Church history, history of Christianity. I don't know whether this also in the English speaking world is a heavy debate. In Germany, that's a heavy debate. And uh, it's a heavy debate in the sense that church history is uh, the title of the discipline for the older one, uh, for the more conservative, and history of Christianity for the more, how to say, a more progressive people. And the idea is history of Christianity is also history of minorities, is uh, more diversity. Uh, history of the church is the weak history, the weak interpretation of history of my own social group. <clears throat> in fact, I have the impression um, that's a little bit, um, as we German um, uh, label this, a uh, uh, battle uh, about uh, Caesar's beard. Uh, <laughs> it's not necessary to, to battle on it because um, my impression, I'm shortening a little bit uh, this paragraph, um, because um, all interesting uh, attempts to write history of Christianity are in certain way related to a certain specification and to a broader perspective. There is always a relation between an inner perspective I'm dealing with the history of the Manichaeans in the oasis of Torfa. Um, and I'm writing the history of this subgroup of Christianity. In fact, uh, certain subgroups, there are Syriac monks uh, and they are related to the Manichaeans and so forth. I'm writing this history and uh, I'm writing this history as the inside of a larger story. So I would, um, I'm shortening also this paragraph a little bit, I would propose that church history is the inner side of uh, history of Christianity. That as the outer side, if understood in the right way. So um, history of Christianity is presenting the um, inner history of one single Christian church, but here you realize um, I'm coined by Protestant uh, of, of general um, ideas <coughs> and categories. I have a number of churches and not one single uh, true church and the others as whatever, that, that's a question <laughs> to <laughs> different uh, forms of Catholic theology. But uh, to, to be honest, in, in a Catholic university, um, that's probably one of the moments where you realize in my description of the relation between church history and history of Christianity that I'm coined by a Protestant mm -hmm. view of uh, of Christian worldview, and not uh, by a, let's say, strong Catholic um, in the sense of uh, Benedict uh, XVI's views of Ratzinger's worldview. Um, so uh, I would think I um, uh, skip this paragraph because it's quite clear um, to, to end really after 15 minutes. Um, that I think um, the, the battle on the designation of what we are doing, there, there are also other battles. Certain of the chairs in Germany are labeled chairs for historical theology. Certain are labeled patristics. My chair is named ancient church history and patristics. There are people arguing patristics are excluding the mothers of the church. Yes, probably yes, when looking to uh, the first 
books presented in the 16th century at Protestant faculties. There are the Orthodox Church Fathers and uh, Johann Gerhard is the first no woman in it. Um, but I would um, recommend to use these traditional designations. We have traditional terminology and designations in our whole scholarly work, and it's impossible to skip them all out. So I would recommend to use it. I, what I proposed, uh, church history as the inner side of history of Christianity as the, the outer side is one attempt to um, justify the uh, traditional terminology. It's not necessary to change all the names of chairs of church history into a history of Christianity. One can do a church history as part of a history of Christianity. The last paragraph before my general conclusions uh, is um, a universal history from a Christian perspective. And that's a question I'm now shortening a little bit uh, the manuscript. That's a question concerning one designation of the discipline I cited 10 minutes before. The idea that church history uh, or history of Christianity is a branch of general history, like military history, like, don't know, history of fishing, like history of... Uh, so a lot of subdivisions and church history slash history of Christianity is one of these subdivisions. You can do the history of the community of fishermen in Perth, there is a community of fishermen in Germany. Uh, yes, uh, wonderful. <laughs> Example is not completely wrong. And you can ask the question concerning the uh, Reformed Church of the Calvinistic tradition. Um, that's probably a kind of, how to say, downplay of the relevance of the categories I have mentioned. And certain people um, are proposing against this approach, um, history of Christianity, um, church history is one branch, uh, and studying a subgroup, or um, and um, putting against this definition the idea it's a universal history according to Christian categories. Um, I have certain hesitations because to my impression, this idea, history of Christianity slash church history is a universal history or a global history according to the worldview or uh, framed by the worldview of a Christian faith. That's often how to say preface history. It's expressed in prefaces, in prolegomena, but when asking the question, do we really have a global history of Christianity which satisfies at the moment the, um, our uh, methodological level and state of the art uh, of historical disciplines? Or are there the only, how to say, fashion? It's fashion at the moment. Uh, universal history was fashion in the 50s and 60s. That there is a yearbook concerning universal history in Germany, but most of the publications are not really universal history. And now, since some, um, I would think, two decades, global history is fashion, but um, it's more a declaration. And um, this is a moment where I have personally to confess um, I have serious difficulties with my specific knowledge to write a global history of the world in antiquity. Chinese. Um, what I really know when studying the um, uh, oasis of Torfa, I have serious difficulties. I'm not familiar with the Turkic language languages. I have serious difficulties to understand the Chinese history from a Chinese perspective, not from the perspective of the Manichaeans or the Syriacans. 
So when uh, this form of history is only possible as a collaborative work, not by one single person. And so um, also this is perhaps a, um, expressed with a certain form of humility, the, the idea that um, church history, history of Christianity is often not more than a, a limited history like the fisherman's or, uh, of earth history um, is perhaps a modest form to describe what we are really doing. Um, it's always nice to express this preface prolegomena history, but um, it's better to describe in a dense way what we are really doing. And this allows us, us so to say, uh, because I'm sitting here in a department uh, of theology and philosophy, that allows us to be part of a large interdisciplinary group of historians and theologians. <coughs> so I have uh, cut it down a lot of my manuscript. I'm happy uh, to be criticized, um, corrected, um, uh, informed about things I have neglected. And uh, it's a pleasure that we uh, Tuesday, Thursday and Friday will uh, recollect again. And now I'm happy to hear comments and a lot of other things in the reception after and greetings to the people at the screen. Um, they cannot ask questions, but uh, uh, I'm happy to answer uh, urgent questions via mail. Um, not this night, <laughs> which I need for a certain rest, but uh, probably in uh, the next days. And uh, to all of you which are not able to come with us for the reception, a wonderful evening or whatever time you uh, are facing now, a wonderful morning, uh, afternoon, or whatever. Many thanks. And it was such a confronting question. What are we doing? It's a, it's a terrible thing to think about yet again. But also, thank you for explicating the assumptions that shape, control, hopefully liberate our stances and our categories as scholars in relation to Christian history, in history, whether we regard ourselves as theologians or historians or some hybrid, I don't know. Um, so you destabilize you, and I'm looking forward to these few days because they may be destabilizing, rejuvenating us perhaps, um, but we look forward more to the chapters that follow over the next few days. So thank you so much. Um, for those present, thank you for being here. Um, as Christoph said, there's wine and canopies to follow. My regrets to those online, and I see people in far away UK and elsewhere. Um, thank you for giving your mornings to this. Uh, the daytime sessions will be more conducive to those in the United States than those um, in the UK. But if you feel like being up very early, and I see people there nodding that they will be, I do your word. Um, we look forward to having you join us. So do please join me once again in thanking uh, Professor Mukshish for. Um, giving us a tantalizing introduction to what lies ahead of us. <laughs>